and third uh, uh, PSR webinar in the series. Uh, I hope that you have uh, watched the uh, webinars by Drs. Paulson and Ingrafia. And uh, tonight we're going to share personal stories and clinical issues in the Mar Marcello Shell regions of Pennsylvania. I will be joined by three other speakers who will be sharing their stories with you. And um, here's a map of uh, Pennsylvania. All right, so you guys can all see my screen. And um, so uh, hopefully you've you know, heard what I had to say. Um, so I'm going to keep going just in the interest of time. All right, so um, here's a map of Pennsylvania with the counties and the well clusters, as you can see, kind of starting from southwest, arching over to the northeast. And the uh, three people that we have joining us tonight, um, Jenny, who is in um, Jefferson County, Barbara, who is in Lycoming County, and uh, Dr. Michelle Kowalski, who is in Lucerne County. So um, I'm going to set some ground rules first. What do we mean by um, fracking? Some of this stuff was already reviewed by Dr. Paulson and uh, Dr. Ingrafia. However, as you know, this method was started in 1946, but it's a very different process than what we have now which is what we call high volume hydraulic fracturing with long laterals. Um, and so four technologies contributed to um, the advancement of this um, uh, engineering technology. One of them was directional drilling, whereas um, in the past we had vertical drilling. Now we could um, go parallel to the various geological formations, possibly um, um, horizontally, and go uh, one to two miles um, in that direction. The second one was um, um, fluid volumes of much higher magnitudes than we had before. And then with the addition of slick water um, or chemicals that reduce friction and increase efficiency of fracturing fluids, many of them were proprietary. And the last one was that in the past it was um, one well, one pad, but now here you have um, one well site with um, multiple wells, even as many as 12. So um, in summary, when we um, refer to fracking, we are referring to the entire life cycle of exploration, extraction, and transport. Um, we're going to focus on Pennsylvania tonight. However, we're going to draw on some of the experiences of, the, um, of Colorado, which is another state where hydraulic fracturing occurs. In the health impact assessment that happened in Colorado, um, they identified uh, multiple stressors in eight areas of concern. Um, that was related to the rapid industrialization. One of them was air quality, um, uh, smog, diesel. The other one was water quality, unknown chemicals, traffic and construction, and we're going to um, touch upon that, noise exposure, and um, economic conditions and economic disparities, as well as social conditions, health infrastructure, which we will not um, touch upon tonight, which can be a whole other discussion onto itself, and then accident and malfunctions. So first off, we're going to go to our first um, guest speaker, Barbara Jamorska, who is a teacher, business owner, um, writer, and wellness consultant. She recently retired from her 32 years of um, being a founder and president of Fresh Life in Williamsport, PA. She lives on 20 acres of unleased land in Loyal Sox State, the um, forest region of north central Pennsylvania. That area, as you could see before, it was um, very heavily uh, drilled and it's been called the Marcellus Sacrifice Zone. She serves on the board of directors of the Responsible Drilling Alliance. It's a grassroots group that's based in Lycoming County. The RDA mission is seeking the truth about the consequences of deep shell drilling. Are you ready? Can you hear me? Are we set? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy life to be with us tonight. And thank you for allowing me to share my story as well as the photographs I've taken of my home and rural neighborhood. As Dr. Saberi said, I'm a 65-year-old grandmother and recently retired business owner. And back in 2007, before I had ever heard the words Marcellus Shale, I cashed in the lion's share of my retirement portfolio and built a small retreat center on 20 acres of land that had been in my family for four generations. 
I wanted a place where nearby city dwellers, especially children and teenagers, could, without financial burden or significant travel time, disconnect from technology, there is no TV or cell service where I live, and reconnect with the natural world, that which renews our soul and spirit. This land has always been where the very best days of my childhood played out, including summers spent here with my family in a cabin with no indoor plumbing. Thinking back to summers long ago, my fondest memories are actually the smells and sounds of the land. My sister and I slept on a screen sleeping porch with my grandmother and actually looked forward to bedtime when the three of us would lie awake in the dark listening to hoot owls and bullfrogs and crickets and katydids and other night noises. At first light, would we, we would be awakened by birdsong. These days, I sleep with earplugs. There is a threat at my doorstep that causes me to fluctuate between cowering in fear, basking in denial, and screaming in outrage. I don't know how to do battle with so formidable an enemy. What great irony, as for 32 years I enjoyed a career as a messenger of good health and well-being. These days, I ponder how I might gather my family, pull up stakes, and find a new homeland. We are no longer safe here. The gas industry has arrived and staked its claim to thousands of acres of Penn's woods. The state has leased and the DEP has permitted multiple gas wells on the Loyal Sox State Forest that surround my property. At the present time, the best estimate says I live within an eight-mile radius of 50 to 60 gas wells. For decades, the only access road to this remote, beautiful, and wildlife-rich area was Butternut Grove, a narrow, no-outlet road that goes past my driveway and used to dead end in a hiking trail in the Loyal Sox State Forest. The Loyal Sock Creek is just over the bank, a stone's throw from the road. I could ride my horse or mountain bike up the road to the place where the one-lane road becomes the hike, be, became a hiking trail on state forest land. This trail that you see here is now gone, gated off, and posted with no trespass signs and hard hats required warnings. Chainsaws and gravel carrying dump trucks have changed the trail into a, into a wide gravel road through the forest and onto two well pads built nearly side by side. Many trees were sacrificed to build that road. The once loved trail on land that is called Commonwealth is now gated and posted and no longer welcoming. The lives of all Butternut Grove Road residents have forever changed at the hands of the corporation claiming the right to send its trucks up the road, to foul the air with diesel fumes, to generate noise, to disturb the ecosystem on the mountain, to haul truckloads of toxic fracking chemicals up and millions of gallons of toxic produced water back down. We no longer feel safe enjoying the Loyal Sock Creek. Deemed exceptional value, this beautiful creek begins in Sullivan County and travels 64 miles on its way to the west branch of the Susquehanna River. Unlike the still protected Delaware River Basin, Millions and millions of gallons of Susquehanna River Basin water is now mixed with sand and toxic chemicals and forced at great pressure into the Marcellus Shale. My grandfather bought these 20 acres with their mile-long creek frontage in 1933. The memories my family has made here are priceless, and my grandchildren would have been the fifth generation to run in the meadow, swim in the creek, ride and hike in the nearby woods. In our increasingly transient society, roots this deep are precious and rare. And yet, my son and his family have already moved 300 miles away, north of Brattleboro, Vermont, far from family, but off the shale, seeking a safer place to raise their children. Those of us who remain talk of also abandoning our heritage and leaving the area, refugees of the gas boom. And my story is only one of hundreds many much, much worse than mine. As far as I know, I can still drink my water. It doesn't catch on fire out of the tap, and my animals appear healthy. Do I have the right to grieve over shattered dreams and grandchildren I hardly know? Is it wrong to be angry when brake retarders rattle the window panes in my house 
and the diesel fumes overpower the smells of the damp earth coming through the open windows of my unair conditioned home. My friend Ruth, an organic farmer, shares my burden and in addition worries about what heavier than air chemicals might be settling on the food she grows for a living, food she claims is organic, a claim often accompanied by a slightly raised eyebrow. I'd like to share some words that Ruth wrote with you. To say that the traffic noise these days is ceaseless doesn't get it across how it feels. It feels like having a bathing cap on all the time and not being able to take it off. A bathing cap with earbuds playing whatever it is you hate to hear the most. Yeah, like that. Lately I've been relating to Noriega and how we meant to drive him mad by playing, was it disco, outside his compound. The volume these days, by which I mean both the number of trucks and the decibels produced, is the auditory signature of the stunning success of the shale gas blitzkrieg and its subsequent subjection of the countryside. Oh, that once again the land around would be quiet save for its own sounds, bird sound, and the sound of animals breathing and leaves rustling and ice pinging and wind whistling around corners. Maybe if I listened long enough in that stillness, I'd find the planet's winds are playing the openings of all the songs I know, the ones I haven't learned yet, playing some of them twice to be sure I heard. Like me, Ruth doesn't know what the future holds. She and her partner make half-hearted attempts to look at real estate. But how does one finally leave the place called home, the place where you've built your life for 25 years? How do you move your dogs and cats and rabbits and chickens and small herd of Devon cattle? How do you leave the very soil you have fed and tended and watered and nurtured for over two decades? We feel so vulnerable and so very unprotected by a state constitution that tells us we have, and I quote, a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. The gas industry has been carefully mapping out its strategy for years, pouring millions into the political campaigns of its supporters and into media propaganda that historians may one day declare unequaled in human history. Laws that might have protected us have been challenged and repealed and vetoed. The gas rush is here, and the special places we once called home are now called the Marcellus sacrifice zone. I don't know what the future holds for my grandchildren. I can only hope and pray that one day they might return to this land of their ancestors and this little one as an adult might still be able to look out the window and see a bald eagle drying its wings in the sun. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I, I love listening to that. Um, I'm going to switch over back to me. And we're going to move on. And I'm, um, I wanted to bring up some of the points that um, Barbara so beautifully mentioned. And what, the most important which is that often when we talk about health problems, we think about physical problems. But I want to bring your attention to the fact that the most important determinants of health may not be something um, physical in the body, for example. Um, if, there's, if you've been living in a place where you don't even um, lock your door, but now there's increased rates of crime, that affects your health. If you could have um, uh, you know, nice quiet nights and now you have constant uh, noise and light, light pollution, that increases your health. It elevates blood pressure, for example. And then um, there's also the stress and the mental health issues. Um, noise and light pollution also might bring on sleeping difficulty. The fear of the unknown might bring on anxiety. And um, as Barbara mentioned, for example, in the past, if you were able to take a hike um, in the woods and now that's no longer accessible to you, then you don't have these prior, access to these prior mechanisms of stress management. Um, and it's been shown that if there's lack of transparency, then there's lack of trust in the part of the community in larger infrastructures like the governments or even medical establishments. Um, the 
in environmental medicine, we say that a hazard is not a health risk unless there is a pathway of exposure. So Barbara talked about air pollution from traffic, for example, the like diesel exhaust, particulate matter 2.5, um, and, uh, and some of the pathways of exposure like truck traffic. And so in, uh, in these cases, you have both the hazard and the exposure, and therefore um, there is increased health risks in, in terms of um, pulmonary function and or exacerbation of pre-existing um, conditions like cardiovascular conditions. This shows you a bird's eye view of what are some of the sources where you might get um, air pollution, um, air, fugitive air emissions. And um, by that, I'm going to move on to the next section, which is talk about the occupational exposure. We're going to uh, focus on one um, aspect. However, before that, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on the various different occupations that are involved in unconventional gas development. The one that you might have heard the most about is silica sand mining and transport. There's also transportation of other things like water and waste and supplies. There's support industries, for example, the landmen. And then um, we have uh, various different drill site activities that where workers uh, work on the preparation, the drilling, um, and production. There's a disposal of the waste, and then um, it's not just the workers. The workers might be um, protected by certain measurements, but then the community around it might be exposed to as much of the silica dust as, pop, as um, the workers might be, for example. Um, some of the other ones would be is radiation exposure. Um, naturally occurring radioactive material come up with um, flowback or produced water. Radon is a big problem in that, especially in a state like Pennsylvania where um, there's radon rich regions. There is uh, noise from, there's noise from drilling and hydraulic fashioning activities and if it sounds really loud from in a block away, imagine how it sounds sounding right next to it. And this is a 24 hour industry, it's all seasons, there's long work shifts, extended work periods and extreme weather conditions. The, um, our largest body of knowledge comes from NIOSH, where about two years ago they um, embarked on field work of measuring several different things. Um, and as I said, silica is the one that you might know mo the most about because they released a health hazard alert about it. But that's not the only thing that they look at. They look at um, hydrogen sulfide exposure as well as um, other components like volatile organic compounds and diesel exhaust. So with that, I'm going to move on and introduce Dr. Michelle Kowalski who, like myself, is an occupational and environmental medicine physician from Lucerne County. And um, as you remember, she is right on the, um, the border of where the um, activity is moving towards in Northeast PA. And she's going to discuss risk assessment of the effects of increased motor vehicle traffic in areas in Northeast PA where unconventional natural gas activities are occurring. Take it away, Dr. Kowalski. Thank you, Dr. Saberi. Thanks for inviting me to talk today. As a physician in northeastern Pennsylvania, I'm often asked about the health risks of natural gas drilling. And we certainly consider all the occupational ones that Dr. Saberi delineated. And we look at some data, um, but we don't have data that's specific to Pennsylvania right now as to what the effects are or will be of natural gas drilling for many of the potential health effects. Um, what, we, what we do notice, though, when the companies move in is the traffic, as Barb's piece so eloquently uh, displayed for us. NPR did a, a piece on this not too long ago where they said the traffic is the symbol of the gas industry. And that's initially not bad. In this piece, they pointed out where there's traffic, there's people to spend money. They bring on a lot of people. There is a boom to the economy, just like in the ghost towns of old. However, when these companies move out of the areas where they've done their drilling, they leave behind some pretty sobering statistics with regard to the traffic. This was also in the boom town companies, pay roads, they pipe pilot, and move on. This was recently in our paper, the Times Tribune, just published uh, May 6, 2014. The Associated Press had done an analysis of traffic deaths in the U.S. where there was drilling in six states. In these states, the fatalities were four times greater since 2004 
during a time when most American roads had become safer. You can see why this would be, as you saw in the previous slides, there could be 2,300 to 2,400 truck trips per well going over these roads, mainly carrying water, but certainly a lot of exposure to increased traffic. So what can we say? We want to see whether or not this increased traffic is causing harm. Do we have any data on that? We certainly expect as the population grows, maybe there's more accidents, but is it out of proportion to what we would expect? So I focused on Bradford County, Pennsylvania, an area near and dear to me, just north of where I live in Luzerne County. There is no drilling in Luzerne, but in Bradford there's quite a bit right now. My family used to camp up here. The Susquehanna runs through here, very pretty country. This is the drilling now. You can see it's been a focus of a lot of activity in recent years. And this Statistics we can use are put out by the Pennsylvania DOT, Department of Transportation. What, when we look at these, we have to realize that there are only three types of accidents that will be recorded. Injury to person, injury to vehicle, property damage only, or fatality. So you do have to remember you're not capturing many of the accidents that may be just fender benders where a policeman is not called to the scene. But nonetheless, they do give us some data we can use. And when you look at this, it is online, publicly available. This is what you would see in a crash statistics booklet, basically just the year, the population of the county, and the number of injuries total, and then broken down into those categories. And something interesting happens as we plot this on a graph. If we look at these uh, curves, the pink line is the new wells. The blue line is the total number of motor vehicle accidents. So over these years, you can see that the lines parallel each other. When you break it down into the types of accidents, they also parallel the pink line, the new wells. What's even more impressive, this green line at the bottom is the number of fatalities. Fortunately, it's a fairly low overall number, but I lost the slide in here. I'll go back to, back to this. I had a slide where I had wanted to show you that basically the fatalities do parallel the number of wells as well. And that's certainly something that's very concerning to us. We have to realize that with this industry, uh, motor vehicle accidents are not uncommon in the entire oil and gas industry. There are higher uh, accidents in general in oil and gas, and of those, many are motor vehicle accidents. There's many reasons for this. The, Safety rules exempt oil and gas workers to drive longer hours in some areas. Drug use may be more common in these areas. The workers are not unionized, not able to complain about safety problems without being fear of being fired. Also, you have to remember they're going over rural highways. Sometimes they're contractors and they're not familiar with the entire operation. They're just called in to do a particular uh, job. So what's being done about this? Well, NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and OSHA, they've realized that this is a problem. OSHA has put out a booklet, Guidelines for Employers to Reduce Motor Vehicle Crashes in General. NIOSH has had some efforts to focus specifically on the gas industry with their distracted driving campaign and in-vehicle monitoring systems. The gas companies as well realize that this is a problem. And the larger companies have somewhat stepped up to the plate. They realize that they need to hold meetings with everyone who might be involved with the site, including their contractors, maybe even the township supervisors who could advise them over how to move large rigs. They may not anticipate things like low-hanging power lines that the township supervisors would know about or water on road that would cause the trucks to get stuck. They may ask that the uh, voluntarily the speed limits be lower than the state posted. So hopefully with risk assessment, we can get into future safe practices. We know road safety is a known priority. You have to realize some of this in any particular area will get better as time goes on. There's a lot of activity with the trucks in the first two to three months. Very much in the three to five days are actually doing the fracking. And for 20 to 30 years, it's a relatively quiet area, but that's when they're moving on to another area. So we hope that areas like this, where I live, will not be affected as much by the drilling, that 
perhaps they can be left untouched in a while, but if they are, then at least that they're treated a lot more gently than the statistics would show that previous areas of Pennsylvania have been. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pulaski. That's um, very, very um, illuminating. So um, as um, also an official environmental medicine physician, I uh, did a study in uh, Baffert County as well, um, which um, I'm going to um, talk about a little bit um, because uh, Dr. Kowalski's uh, survey was also done in Baffert County. And uh, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to know is whether people are worried about health effects of natural gas activities. And it turns out that one out of four to five people are in fact concerned that natural gas activities will affect their health. And furthermore, one out of eight people do believe they have a health problem that they attribute to an exposure. This is a lot higher than what will be seen in isolated incidents, or what is known as what had what these stories have been called as anecdotes by the uh, the various uh, infrastructures. And and this was exactly what I wanted to do. Is I wanted to get at the fact that these are not anecdotes, but they're sentinels and they're tip of the iceberg, and they are kind of more harbingers of larger um, health impacts that are to come. The other thing that I also found, and this is um, a study that has actually uh, gone to press and will be um, published soon, so you can um, read more details about it, that there is a communication gap between patients and uh, medical providers. And if we are going to um, base our epidemiological studies on, uh, for example, medical records, then we really need to work on this communication gap. This brings us to um, what the medical clause in Act 13, which is also known as the, um, the, gag, the gag rule or the gag clause. As you know, Act 13 had nothing to do with this. It was really about the impact fee you know, and, zone, and, uh, and zoning. But um, it, a, clause, a medical clause was added in there that was taken out of the hazard communication laws um, of OSHA without really any of the, the surrounding um, legal structure that goes with it. And essentially it said that um, health professionals shall maintain the information that they find about the patients that they're treating if it includes confidential proprietary information and they may not share that information with anyone including their patient unless there is a written statement of need and a confidentiality agreement with them. And so in that sense, it was called the GAC clause because it really hampered um, transparency and communication within the, from the industry to the providers and then from the providers to um, their, um, their patients. In Pennsylvania, um, Pennsylvania Medical Society, what, I mean, the question was what are some of the medical societies in Pennsylvania doing about this? The House of Delegates of the Pennsylvania Medical Society in 2013 um, wrote that they are hesitant to call for a moratorium and um, they passed a res resolution that essentially um, calls on the EPA to immediately release their interim results for the ongoing study that they have on the effects of hydraulic fracturing on mainly water. Um, and, um, and this study started in 2012, was supposed to be released in 2014, but um, as I hear it, it's been um, postponed to 2016. So as somebody who has had to deal with a lot of these agencies, we are going to move on to um, Jenny Lissack, and um, she is an organic farmer um, whose farm and family has been impacted by shale gas production. She's a co-director of Pennsylvania Alliance for Clean Water and Air, and um, she is probably most famous for um, having compiled what is known as the list of the harm. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, after she's done. She's um, completed her her piece of this, um, and I'm going to switch over to Jenny now. Jenny?
I'm actually going to move on and talk about the list of the harm um, while she um, is able to um, get back on the call with us. Um, this um, is a list that she combi compiled from um, the uh, folks across the United States who believed that they had been impacted by natural gas activities. And then um, this list is ongoing. It's more than a thousand people. Um, and then Frack Tracker um, started to um, map the locations where these people were. Uh, and this is um, a screenshot of what they had back in um, 2013. So um, one of the things that, um, another one of the big areas of pollution that we talk about is water. And um, as we said, if you have a hazard, for example, the fracking chemicals that we're worried about, the, um, the pathway of exposure exists, as we know, as we've heard Dr. Ingrafi talk about, for example, well casings. And that results in um, health risks, neurologic, reproductive, um, endocrine, and carcinogenic. There was a very nice study that came out that showed that um, rivers that have um, that are near the um, the hydraulic fracturing gas wells have higher compo uh, um, components of endocrine disruptors. So that um, shows that there is um, a pathway of entry into the water. So some of the potential sources of water contamination, you might think that um, that they're very limited, but it's actually not true especially in Pennsylvania where uh, many people rely on um, well water, the um, contamination of the underground aquifers is a problem. And this can happen from the seismic testing to failures in well casing um, um, all the way to um, various spills and accidents, um, impoundment leaks or overflows, and um, to inadequate treatment and disposal. And then um, um, also, Jenny is going to talk about um, the use of brine for de-icing or dust control. The um, potential contaminants of well water um, range from volatile organic compounds to heavy metals, um, sulfur-containing compounds, and as we mentioned, naturally occurring radioactive um, compounds, um, and various other additives which are um, um, proprietary. And then the health effects of the water contaminants, you can look at them in various different ways. There is um, bacterial contamination. Many people said that um, they, in, they never had coliform in their water, but now there's an increased amount of um, coliform uh, in their well water. If you could look at it acute versus chronic. Acute um, can happen to a lot of workers that might be at the site of an accident um, or chronic, which would happen with um, some of the residents. And um, um, organ systems as we talked about um, with neurological, um, respiratory, dermal, or gastrointestinal. And um, some case studies are coming out that are confirming. Um, this slide show, reminds us that um, the uh, methane fugitive emissions that happen during the life cycle of hydraulic um, fracturing uh, from you know, the cradle to grave process the um, fusion methane emissions are much higher than previously thought um, and have been calculated. Uh, not to mention the fact that methane, as you guys probably heard from uh, Dr. Ingrafia, is a far more um, potent greenhouse gas, um, has, has far higher global warming potential as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So the impacts of this on the climate are a lot more than we previously thought. I'm going to go back and see if we can get Jenny back on. Jenny? Hello? Hi, yay, Hello. you're with us. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go back and I'm going to start your slides. Okay, but I, I never went anywhere. I, I, okay. I wasn't <laughs> All right, no problem. Okay, well, hello, everyone. Sorry about the voice. Um, I always thought that if I could just transport myself, Wally is where I'd be. But I never got far from where my ancestors settled with a land grant for serving in the Revolutionary War. But besides exotic Wally, this is my choice place to live, Pennsylvania. My mother pawned us off on my uncle's farm a few weeks every summer when I was young. I entertained myself reading farm journals, playing hide and seek in the eye high grasses, and eating all the juiciest plums my stomach could hold. Since then, my dream was to have a farm. 
much of my life is invested in our farm, and it's our only legacy to our children. My children were born here in the home. My father-in-law died here. The trees that were planted at each child's birth still grow strong. We wrote messages to our future grandchildren under the new wallpaper, buried time capsules for those to follow. The handprints of each child are still imprinted in the concrete of the cistern cover. We planned on growing old here. We never could have imagined having to evacuate. Ours is a perennial crop farm. 500 berry bushes all planted by hand, 100 heirloom apple trees. Every year, a few more trees planted. Apple, pawpaw, pear, peach, cherry, persimmon, mulberry. There is a promise in this evening of a special heirloom that you're willing to wait the years for. Well, all was well until the strangers in the white pickup trucks arrived, and nothing has been the same since. First it was our spring, always pristine, always ample, but after Marcellus Well and the neighboring farm was drilled, the water went bad. DEP determined that the gas company was not culpable, even though it was the only disturbance around. Then we learned of a Marcellus permit for a field only feet from one of our vegetable gardens. The view to the west, where my children would say, sunset news is beautiful, was soon to be spoiled by dozers, trucks, and compressors, the setting sun blocked by a towering rig. Our future appeared to be downwind and only a few hundred feet away from fat wells. Who would our produce customers be now? Who would want to eat vegetables grown so close to such an intensive and toxic industry? Not I nor our customers or friends. And I was in absolute panic and despair. This was a period of extreme stress. I got in touch with every environmental organization I could find. The responses were similar. There is nothing you can do. I contacted DEP, and they told me to send them my objections. I did, and the permit was approved anyway. I then only had a few short weeks to file an appeal. I found that one cannot object to their families living up close and personal to toxic heavy industry. You cannot object to the constant noise, dust, fumes, and light. You cannot object to living next to something that might explode and blow the ones you love sky high. You cannot object to your child's nearest pond now being a radioactive toxic waste filled one. Nor can you object to the potential for your water and home to fill with explosive methane or that your family is not included in their escape plan. I filed the appeal alone, and after literally begging a law clinic to take our case, and after many months of sleepless nights, anxiety, crying spells, depression, nightmares, we got the news that the gas company was going to withdraw the permit. A debilitating weight had been lifted off my shoulders, but things only improved slightly. There was a lasting effect for the whole family. Doesn't everyone like to have a bit of control over their lives? There is no emotional support. So many days if there had been an end it all button, I would have pushed it. And there was more to come. My township contracted with a gas company for dust suppression. I'd seen the tanker going down the dirt lane along the farm on several occasions, but never gave it a thought that it wasn't something safe being spread. Well, one time my two colleagues walked over to the road to check out the tanker. They came back and spent a very long time licking their paws. It turns out the gas company had been spraying produced water or flowback water on the road. They were investigated by the Fish and Boat Commission, charged and fined, and the township secretary had been suspicious all along as the trees were dying in her neighborhood, and she told them not to spray her road anymore. My male colleague died six months later with lymphoma, and the female gave birth to seven stillborn puppies not long after the spraying. Is there a day that goes by that I don't wonder if we're breathing polonium or some other radioactive dust left over on that road? Hardly. And there have been ongoing problems since. One day after rain, a whole paved road was covered with soap dust. Another day, a tanker killed an Amish horse. The road that used to be safe for buggies, bikes, and tractors is now a thoroughfare for chemical trucks, sand trucks, gravel trucks, wastewater haulers, Rigs, compressors, and that of stacking paraphernalia, pruning trees as they go by, and sometimes ripping down wire. Why don't I just move? There hasn't been a day that we haven't given that some thought, but, and I have lots of them. 
I don't want to start over elsewhere. But I'm 61, I'm getting tired. And I love this place. But I never thought I would, I never would find what I have here elsewhere. But I don't want to be forced to move. But who would buy this place with so many toxic time bombs? There are some things that you value that you never think could be stolen from you so easily and so quickly. The security and safety you have living in your home. The peace of mind you have about the air you breathe and the water you drink and bathe in. The beauty and peacefulness of the countryside. I'm so painfully aware that I'm not alone in this toxic predicament. You just heard it from Barbara. I believe I know some of what others are dealing with, and I can hazard a guess that the majority of those on the list of the harms are still dealing with the same issues as the day they spoke out about their travail. So I have kept compiling the list of the harms so we don't forget those people, and for what may be the obvious reason. The same reason that I barrage all my Facebook friends with a steady stream of news about fracking and climate. The reason that I tweet, march, comment, lobby, testify, rally, write, and speak however uncomfortably. So that maybe if I'm loud enough, ardent enough, persistent and persuasive enough, that just maybe the tide will turn. And this toxic practice that is so harmful to people, flora, fauna, water, air, and climate will someday be and thanks for listening, and help us if you can. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. I love listening to you as well. Um, so we, um, we already covered the various um, points that I wanted to bring up about um, Jenny's. And the one thing that um, I did want to bring up is the uh, fact that animals can be, animal health can be sentinel for human health. And, um, and that's actually a very important uh, topic that we're not going to touch about today. And again, it can be a whole other uh, lecture to its own. However, it's um, what we have to be really aware of. And then uh, lastly, the uh, impact of con environmental contamination on, on our food shed. So having said that, I'm going to move on. Um, I'm a board member of the Philadelphia Chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility as well as the, uh, the national um, PSR. Um, Philadelphia PSR has a position where they um, state that they support a safer and sustainable energy production uh, practices solutions. They um, align their mission to protect human health and the environment, advocate for immediate, immediate divestment from extreme methods of natural resource extraction, including high volume hydraulic fracturing, towards sustainable and renewable methods of energy production. Um, um, at Philadelphia PSR, um, we uh, joined the amicus brief on the medical provision, um, against the medical provision of Act 13, as well as the case um, that highlighted um, public health um, uh, non-disclosures. Uh, and lastly, the national PSR also has a position. They support a precautionary approach that includes a moratorium until um, agencies such as EPA develop and implement enforceable rules that provide adequate protection for human health and the environment. And uh, lastly, this is uh, on the page of resources that um, Barb Gutlib, who is the, um, the Environmental Health Program Coordinator of the National PSR, has prepared for you. And um, this can be uh, made available to you um, for you to use um, in future. I thank you so much for joining me on this um, Technologically challenging, however, I felt very strongly about including the voices of other uh, folks from the state of Pennsylvania, so I really thank you for being a partner um, in this uh, venture with us. I will now open it up to questions. Um, it, we have seven minutes. Um, I had hoped we'd have more. However, I'm happy to stay on and answer questions if we go past 9 o'clock, if that's acceptable to you. So um, I think we're going to unmute all lines. Uh, okay, if anyone has a question, please use the hand icon to raise your hand, and then I will unmute you so you can ask your question, or you can type your question into the question box. Okay. Okay, Sheree Eichholz, do you have a question?
Sandy Minnick, can you ask your question? Julia, do you want me to um, unmute them on my end? Uh, yeah. Okay. Actually, Bridget, um, you're unmuted. Can you hear me? Do you want to ask your question? No. I'm not sure. Sherry, can you hear me? Hi, Hi Kenny. Hayes, can you ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Sherry. Sorry. Okay. So you're you're on now. You want to ask your question? No, I, I'm I'm not sure. I apologize. I don't know what happened. I don't have a question. Okay. All right. Thank Great. you. You're welcome. Um. Um. Jerry Wiley, you're on mute. And would you like to ask your question? Okay, um, Janet Hayes' question is, does PSR have a position on alternative resources as a positive response to fossil fuel pollution? Uh, does PS, the national PSR have a position on natural resources? Uh, alternative read? resources. To alternative resources? Um, yes, um, we actually, there's a very uh, strong component of the national PSR. There's a uh, mental health committee that follows very closely the um, alternative uh, you know, re energy resources, and we're a strong proponent of uh, non-combustible forms of energy, and um, um, which really includes solar, wind, um, and geothermal. Um, and we don't support nuclear, um, fossil fuel, and uh, biomass. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, Theodora Songus wanted to know, can you talk a little about the lack of legal recourse for people impacted? Yeah, um, I find that to be part of a, like a, a much bigger picture. What happens is that um, if our governmental agencies are inadequate in answering um, in people's concerns, for example, somebody who has, um, has their water has gone bad and they have health problems and they call Department of Environmental Protection and you know, they don't get the support they need or Department of Health and they don't get the support that they need, um, once they've gone down that road, um, you know, multiple times, then essentially to protect themselves, they have to resort to, you know, legal action. It's, it, what remains for them is legal action. But um, even the, that, the legal resources are also not there because most of the, the um, cases are, you know, um, taken on by uh, private lawyers. And, um, you know, lawyers are just like doctors. There's good ones, there's, you know, not so good ones. There's ones who might be experienced in environmental health and or environmental law and ones who might not be experienced in environmental law. So as a resident, you might not know if this, you know, legal firm has had success and experience in um, environmental law. So you're essentially kind of, um, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's um, luck of the draw. In terms of, and some people find that they have to change, you know, lawyers after having been with one for two years, and now, you know, two years later, and they still haven't gotten um, any uh, resolution to their problems. So, um, yeah, I see that as I do agree that there is definitely limited um, lack of uh, legal resources, and I see that as part of an uh, infrastructural issue. I'd like to just add to that in that 
I agree with Dr. Sabir. There's not a lot of recourse once something has happened other than the private uh, way to go. But people in northeastern Pennsylvania that may be concerned, any baseline data that you can get would be a good idea. For example, many of us are on private wells. We don't really know if the fracking has affected our water quality unless we have a before and after picture. So if there's any way you can test your well to get the before now, um, then you would have something to compare it to. Same with health. Uh, keep good records of your own health keep and find out what the records would be if there are effects that you think are due to the fracking. It's all about data um, in the end. I've also unmuted um, Barbara and I've tried to unmute um, Jenny just in case there's, um, there are questions that are directed to them. Uh, we have an interesting test case here in Lycoming County that is currently tied up in the court system um, that will be a real pre could potentially be a real precedent center set setter, not in terms of health but in terms of Act 13 regulations, which of course Act 13 was the um, uh, the 2012 Oil and Gas Act that has parts of it have recently been declared unconstitutional by the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. This is the same act that includes the physicians, the nickname so-called physicians gag rule that Dr. Saberi was speaking about earlier in the presentation. But um, a group of homeowners have actually sued their township for allowing the gas company to drill um, so close to their homes. So this is kind of a different angle. Um, must, many of the lawsuits have been brought against the gas companies themselves, which of course have tremendously deep pockets and basically just keep appealing and keep things tied up in court until the people bringing the lawsuit are literally out of money. So uh, this, one, this one is new and uh, it, the briefs have been filed and uh, the judge who read the briefs actually issued a stay against the gas company. So, Currently, construction on that well pad has stopped, and there's a lot of people uh, keeping a close eye on how this is going to go down. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Julia, do you have more questions for us? Or should we uh, raise yeah. people's? Um, Monica Valier wanted to know if there's any research or statistics on the health issues reported in children. Right. So the talk to listen to would be Dr. Paulson because um, he is a pediatrician and he heads the um, pediatric environmental health units and they are actually very uh, interested in following this um, issue because, uh, you know, as you know, children are not small adults. Um, their physiology, their, you know, um, um, access to health care, many things make this a lot worse for them. The margin of safety is a lot, lot higher for them. Uh, so the one study, there is, okay, there's been a couple of studies that have um, looked at the um, cancer and um, respiratory conditions in children. Um, in terms of asthma, there was, a, they showed that um, children around the Dallas-Fort Worth area, in, I believe it was in, um, in ages were eight to nine, had um, a 25% increased risk of asthma. And um, this was part of the, you know, the, the air studies that came out of Texas. And then there's been a couple that have looked at um, pediatric uh, cancers like leukemia. One was in Pennsylvania. However, um, they didn't see uh, a, an increase. However, um, you really, you know, hydraulic fracturing took off in Pennsylvania in 2006. And, um, and it actually it wasn't really until 2009 where there was, you know, the kind of the explosion of the well. So we really haven't had the lead time to see anything um, regarding pediatric um, oncological conditions. So those um, would be the two main um, um, uh, uh, studies that I can quote you about um, children. But like I said, the PEHSU, um, P-E-H-S-U, is the um, website to go in terms of um, their um, statements on hydraulic fracturing. Dr. Sabir, are you familiar with the recently published and peer-reviewed study on low birth weight? Yes. Okay. Right. So, you know, in my mind, um, I think of, thank you for saying that, I think of reproductive health 
differently as um, children, but that's a really good point. So this stud there was a couple actually, um, there, there's three that I can think of that have been done on um, pregnancy and kind of the perinatal period. Um, one was, and, and most, and um, several of them have looked at, one came out of Colorado, Dr. McKenzie, the one of them came um, out um, of Cornell, but Elaine Hill, and the other one, um, I forget exactly where they were from, I want to say Brown, but I'm not sure. Um, and essentially, they looked at various different markers um, of, of health in the perinatal period, one of them being low birth weight. The reason low birth weight is important is because it's a future predictor of other things like, for example, cognitive skills. Um, and so they showed that there was an increase in um, low birth weight around um, areas with um, high natural gas activity. And then um, in Colorado, they also looked at other markers, for example, um, um, neurological um, um, disorders and um, a, a congenital defects. So uh, those studies have come out, they have been peer reviewed, and they have shown an increase in the, um, the risk of having adverse outcomes um, around pregnancy and infancy as it relates to proximity to uh, natural gas. I don't know if you have, do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Kowalski? Just that those studies did actually um, correlate within living within, um, I think it was a mile of the well versus more than a mile from the well, and living within a mile of the well was when they saw the adverse outcomes. All right. Julia, do we have anybody else? Um, yes, uh, Nancy Fisher wanted to know what are the dangers from H2S from flare stacks? Hydrogen sulfide. Do you want to talk about that? She's an expert in hydrogen sulfide. Again, we don't have any um, numbers yet, but there is certainly the concern that the uh, asthma is much worse because of this. Um, there's a lot of ongoing studies right now to try to determine just how bad this is, but um, it's a concern that, that the, the, it's a, not just a problem for certainly the people living right next to the well, but maybe just the entire community. Yeah. The, the main issue with hydrogen sulfide is not the main issue. The most obvious issue is the odor. Um, it has, it's kind of a tremendous quality issue in terms of, you know, the odor that it produces. And I don't know if you guys listened to Dr. Paulson's um, they exempted hydrogen sulfide as one of the hazardous air pollutants. And so that means that it's not monitored or, um, um, you know, uh, controlled, essentially. So that makes it um, a significant problem in that sense. But, um, but um, hydrogen sulfide is a component that is measured as an outdoor air pollutant. And outdoor air pollutants have been classified as a um, definite carcinogens by the International Agency for um, on Cancer Research. So um, in the sense that it does um, contribute to respiratory conditions and future lung cancers, it's a health risk and that it's not monitored in terms of its emissions from the, um, um, the natural gas activity sites. It's a definite problem. And the main issue is um, NIOSH uh, is, is looking at it in terms of the worker exposure to hydrogen sulfide. And as you know, like hydrogen sulfide um, leads to acid rain um, as well. So then, you know, you also get, you know, the kind of the water problems with that as well. So that's what I would say. Um, any other questions, Julia? Um, okay, Yuri Gorby wanted to know what we can do to help people like Jenny. Yeah, um, I think I, I, I have to, I should unmute Yuri Gorby and have, I'm going to, Yuri, can you hear me? Yuri, can you hear me? You're unmuted. Yuri? No, okay. I was going to unmute him because he actually has a lot to say um, about um, how we can help, uh, you know, folks like Jenny. But um, you know, and that's a you know a large, large question in 
and that's why you know organizations like Physicians for Social Responsibility have the statements that we do where we say that we just need to move away from technologies that um, in the name of energy production cause so much uh, you know damage to communities to people as well as to the environment so um, you know having said that then we need to look at the big picture of what can we do in terms of investing in non-combustible forms of energy what can we do um, on reducing the impacts on climate change because you know what's good for the planet is good for the people and vice versa um, so I see this as you know a much larger picture of um, the various things that we have to do we must do to um, help and protect and support people like Jenny and other folks in the list of the harm. I don't know if um, I've been trying to unmute Jenny as well, um, but um, let me see if I can do that as well. And Barbara, if you have anything to say about that, um, please feel well, free. I, you know, one of the biggest issues that we are concerned about right now is the approval of LNG exports because we know. Um, that production in these wells falls off drastically in the first year. And if we indeed start to liquefy this gas and ship it overseas, and we enter into contracts with foreign countries to supply the gas, we are then going to be forced to just continue to turn the regions over the Marcellus and other shale plays literally into just pin cushions. So it, it is a frightening prospect to think that that we are going to, um, that this, this country is going to approve LNG exports. There is a big national rally in Washington, D.C. on Sunday, July 13th, a protest. So and I, I just think that continually hounding legislators, signing on to letters, making your voice heard, um, the the conversation is very unbalanced. There is actually um, a really interesting research study being done right now by Dr. Chris Clark at uh, at uh, uh, oh, um, Mason um, Univers uh, Mason University in Washington D.C. George Mason University in Washington D.C. about media and the the, the propaganda and the um, people's perceptions of the media's portrayal of the natural gas industry. And if anybody's interested in participating in that survey, he's looking for other people to take his survey. And I can send you the link. But uh, you know, the, 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 the conversation is so out of balance. And so anything you can do to add your voice to the side of protest and concern and moratoriums and bans and better regulations and wherever you stand along that continuum um, just to continue to take action. Uh, but, it, but especially right now with this whole LNG situation, it's a really frightening prospect. Right, yeah. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. It's very important. All right, Julia, do we have anybody else? I've, do you have written people? I have three people who still have their hands up. Should we try and um, see? Uh, Catherine Kay had a question about um, how can we hold the gas lobby accountable since they are exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act? Um, yeah, the, um, as I'm sure you know, the Energy Bill of 2005 exempted the industry from the Safe Water Act. And so to um, to, and essentially, it's going to take another act of Congress to reverse that. And, and I know that several um, senators have uh, uh, sponsored acts, the FRAC Act, uh, that would reverse the, that would re lift this, the, the, the political immunity for the oil and gas industry. Um, and um, I, what really the main, and again, I see this as a legislative, um, uh, solution in that it needs to be, you know, um, put back on in the hands of the Congress for them to reverse that. Um, I don't know if any of the other speakers have a different opinion or 
Certainly that is um, of concern, the Safe Water Drinking Act, and I agree with what Dr. Saveri said, but we have to remember, too, again, a lot of the people that are affected by this wouldn't be covered under the Safe Water Drinking Act anyway because we're private wells. So if, unless you are talking about, you know, 15 or more, um, that doesn't apply to a private well anyway. So even when they go, so that is a big thing, it, with or without that, it's still a concern. Yeah. Safe water but but it is my understanding that another part of the uh, of the Safe Water Drinking Act exemption and a really huge part of it is is permitting the gas industry to call their the water that's coming back up the well bore after they they drill. So on average, they're shoving six to nine million gallons of water down into the ground, and approximately one third of that comes back up. In any other industry that water, produce water, flow back, whatever word you want to use for it, would be labeled as a toxic waste. But because of that 2005 exemption, it is labeled residual waste. And that's a huge, huge loophole in, in how that water is handled. So it's not, it's not an exclusion that, just, that doesn't apply to private drinking water wells. It applies across the board to everybody because of that particular classification, which is one of the, it's an enormous concern. Right. And That's Jenny, right. you were talking about it, uh, they were spreading it on your roads, uh, which, yeah. is, which is frightening. Be, and they were allowed to spread it on your roads because it is legally classified as residual waste, where in any other industry it would be considered a toxic waste byproduct. Right. No, no excuse me, they weren't allowed to spread it on the road. They, you're not, they were not allowed to spread uh, waste from unconventional wells on the road, but nobody checks the tanks. Yeah. So that's how they were, they were just doing it anyway, to get rid of it. Yeah. And, um, and um, yeah, right, because Clean Water Act also applies to navigable waters, and so anything that would be dumped in, you know, rivers and, um, you know, streams, etc., would also be um, covered if this were reversed, so in that sense it would be good. But, you know, the Safe Water Drinking Act is what makes municipal water in the United States is one of the safest in the world. And so, um, you know, that also, the, the exemption from that needs to be reversed as well because um, that would allow um, um, the private well drinking wells to be, um, the drinking water to also be right. um, monitored a lot, you know, to have more jurisdiction to monitor those. All right. Julia, do we have anyone else? Um, well, there's one more hand raised. Let me see if I can get him on. Um, Stephen Rubin, do you have a question? Uh, yes, if you can hear me. Uh, I tried to type this in, but perhaps I didn't, didn't arrive. Uh, today there was, a, there was a piece on, uh, I think it was State Impact, the NPR program, uh, regarding, yes. the, the, regarding the silencing of health officials when received and receiving calls from concerned citizens about the hazards of drilling. Uh, have you encountered the, this at all? Uh, any kind of um, sort of injunctions not to respond to, to questions or any kind of pressuring uh, in terms of your, your research or your, your findings from your, from your research? I'm assuming you're referring to me. Um, uh, so, you know, I might actually let Jenny and Barbara answer that, but I, here's what I will say. If you go to the Department of Health website and you type in hydraulic fracturing, you will not get any, um, you will not get any articles or any items that actually come out of Department of Health on that topic. So what I will say is that, in my experience, they have been fairly silent about it. So, but, you know, I'll um, pass the mic to um, Jenny and uh, Barbara and see if they have anything more to say about that. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I have... I have the the, uh, the state impact article actually was still booted up on my computer screen. It's retired uh, folks. I just just briefly read from it. Two retirees from the Pennsylvania Department of Health say its employees were silenced on the issue of Marcellus drilling. One veteran employee says she was instructed not to return phone calls from residents who expressed health concerns about natural gas development. 
quote, we were absolutely not allowed to talk to them, said Tammy Stuck, who worked as a community health nurse in Fayette County for 36 years. Another retired employee confirmed that. Um, a program specialist with the Bureau of Epidemiology said the department began requiring field staff to get permission to attend meetings outside the department. And he said in more than 20 years, when he worked for the department, community health was never told to be silent on any other topic I can think of. This is a pretty I, big deal. I can attest to that. I called the Department of Health several occasions. Once I called them about the, the uh, misting impoundment that you saw the picture of uh, because she, your throat constricts, you know, when you're walking past. And they did not return my call about that. And the other time I called about the impoundment that was proposed. I was very concerned about that. I just, it was going to be so close, I just, you know, I needed some help. And at, the only thing she said to me was, oh, yes, you know, the, you could have a problem with West Nile virus, which was kind of really ridiculous. And she gave me the number of DEP to call, but of course they're the ones that permitted it anyway. And I also called the United States Department of Health, and they told me they uh, it was a legal issue and they couldn't get involved. I, I don't know why. So no help from Department of Health. I will say that that experience is not unique to Jenny. I have I personally have heard that from many other people. Very good question. Um, any other questions, Julia? Uh, Yuri Gorby, do you have a question? Yuri, do you have a question? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I think there's a slight delay, but uh, that's okay. Okay, you're on the air. Wonderful. I was, uh, well, there was a couple of things. Resources to help people like Jenny, um, you know, directly. Are there any resources available to help with uh, health-related issues, loss of um, property value, every, anything, you know, anything that we can do to help individuals at all? And then I have a follow-up question as well about uh, the quality of rain, precipitation in impacted areas, but I'll ask that in a second. Yeah, so, you know, like I know that I keep saying that this is more, you know, this is that the infrastructure helping to be there, but, you know, what happens is that when it's not there, then it falls under various organizations to provide that. So, for example, one of the organizations that I believe um, and it has put together a pretty good um, educational material is the Southwestern PA Environmental Health Project um, in the southwestern part of Pennsylvania. And they're, you know, a very good resource in terms of referring people to, you know, other various resources. Um, but, you know, Jerry, what you're, because you mentioned, you know, several different aspects, which was, one was health, one was, you know, like property value, you know, and so, what, and that's kind of like, I don't really know of one place to go to get all of that, and that's what makes it so fragmented. You know, you have to go for this year and for that there, and, and that's not even, um, you know, like, uh, and it's not that it's going to help you in that it's going to, you know, like raise your property value or anything like that. But, uh, you know, but um, the least you can do is just you know, give you information. Um, I don't know if um, Jenny herself or Barbara have any other comments in terms of what would be kind of good one-stop shops um, or other various resources for um, impacted people? Yeah, unfortunately, there is there is not a one-stop uh, place. There's not a, there's not a central hub where you can go and get the proper referral or information. There's a lot of organizations doing a lot of good work, but we're also busy playing in a whack-a-mole because there's so many pr there's new problems popping up every day. The industry is way out ahead of us. That that's the problem. They, yeah. you know, it's it's happening at warp speed, and it's impossible to keep up. 
I keep trying to convince my township supervisors if I had help doing that. You know, he the last time I spoke to them, they said, well, it's a democratic process, and the majority are for it. But, you know, of course, I don't feel the same way. But if I could, if I, I just oftentimes, I think if someone could go with me and help me talk some sense into them, you know, this, this should not be up close to families. So that's an idea, but I don't, I don't know who that agency would be. Um, Yuri, do you have any resources that you can share with us? Well, I've actually expended all my personal resources, uh, you know, purchasing air scrubbers and things for people. And so that's, you know, and you, you feel like you're doing something good, but you, you know, quickly realize that there are so many people that are impacted that you don't know where to turn first, and it's a burden on any one person or maybe even one organization to help. Now, Jenny, you did say something, though, to have somebody beside you to, you know, to make your voice, like legitimize your voice, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, that that's something that I think is, uh, would be quite helpful in your own townships, you know, in, in those, in your local areas where people, some people are benefiting, uh, profiting from uh, the development um, while others are suffering. I think that, yeah, maybe an outside voice is something that, that would be helpful in, in that uh, community conversation that you enter into. Right. The other question that I had, uh, just a quick question, was um, the impact on uh, the quality of rain. I know a lot of people where that have lost their wells uh, from drilling and then have been uh, uh, kind of supplementing their water supplies with rainwater catchment and are now finding that uh, there is uh, some problem with that water. In fact, there's uh, probably lots of problems with the, the rainwater that they're catching. Is there anybody, uh, do you know of any um, studies that are ongoing or, or launching uh, to characterize the quality of rainwater in impacted areas? I know we hear a lot about, you know, acid rain. We all know about that, but I'm just wondering if, if we're considering chemical rains that are uh, coming down on people. Uh, I don't. That's actually really interesting that you say that, that, um, you know, rain, cotton, rain barrels are being used, which is actually a very resourceful way of doing it. But like we said, you know, if you live next to, um, uh, you know, a, a well where there's hydrogen sulfide being emitted into the air, then, yeah, it's quite possible that you might get polluted rainwater. Um, but I don't know of any. That's interesting. Very good question, Yuri. Do you have yeah, any I'm other asking questions? it just because I'm trying to finish. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's just that I'm trying to uh, finish a proposal to the USDA, the, um, the Department of Agriculture, on that topic, on, on uh, basically chemical rains, the impact of not just not just hydraulic fracturing uh, and related uh, activities, but uh, increased agriculture use of chemicals in agriculture. It's not as apparent, you know, I mean, it was easy to track the pH of rainwater and see its impacts on forests and lakes in New England. Um, from the high sulfur coal burning in the Midwest, in Ohio, West Virginia. But um, I think that we are really missing a larger problem right now, and that is the, the presence of these new chemicals that are being released into our atmosphere, coming down on people, having impacts uh, not only directly on people, but also on ecosystems, farmlands, water supplies. So. Yeah. No, very good point. I'm sure it would be a you know, we'd love to see the result of the study if it gets funded and you find something. Julia, do we have any other questions? Um, I think that's it. We have one. Um, is this on the raised um, hand from Monica Valier? Is that a question that we attended already or is it a new question? Monica, do you want to ask your question? All 
All right, Julia, if that's it, then we can um, call it a night. It's um, it looks like Jenny is not connected right now. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next segment. Uh, Dr. Saberi, are you there? Okay, so it seems as if um, Jenny's having a little bit of a difficulty um, calling in. So I'm Jenny and the Marcella Shell, for those of you who might not be from this region. The Pennsylvania, um, as you can see, lies on top of the Marcellus Shelf. Two thirds of it is covered it is um, um, over the Marcellus Shelf, and as you can see, it extends over to New York, Ohio, and West Virginia. Uh, Doctor, sorry, I'm not seeing the map on the screen right now. This one? Are you not seeing it? No. Do you have your screen Thanks. paused? Can you see it now? Can you see it now? Um, I see the first slide. Um. What? Can you see my screen? Yeah, I see the first slide with the names of the presenters. Okay. Okay. Great. There All right. Is. So. Thank you. All right. So there we're in business.